So you join me here today at one of the biggest events of the year, uh, Festival of the Unexceptional, a uh, really popular event. We, I think it probably took best part of an hour to actually get in here this morning. Um, first car I've spotted here today uh, for an interview is uh, this Lancia Y10 owned by Craig. Now, Craig, I can't remember the last time I saw one of these. Um, no, uh, probably the first time I've seen one in about three years was when I saw this one at Letchworth Motor Auctions earlier this year and I thought, well, that's a bit different. Um, and a friend of mine was at the sale, so I phoned him up and said, could be quite interested in that. And he phoned me up about three hours later and said, by the way, you just bought it. <laughs> I was like, oh, right, OK. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, almost an accidental purchase. Um, Certainly a bit different. Left-hand drive, so that, that's that's fun. Where I live in the in Cambridge, with very rutted, bumpy roads and, and what have you. But yeah, you know, you you don't ever see another one coming the other way. So well, if it's quite a compact car, though, is it? It's not like driving some big American car that's uh, left-hand drive down narrow lanes. No, the only problem is the roads around me are very bumpy, and of course you're on the bumpy side of the road if you're sitting there. So right, okay. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. So a nice car if you're a passenger then. <laughs> yeah, it's hilarious to be honest. It's great fun to drive. Yeah, so. and it's got such novelty value. Yeah, so yeah. Now I weren't sure even if I could sort of vaguely remember them, but I yeah. weren't hundred percent if they were sold in UK. I understand they were. They were. Yeah, yeah. You could get a right-hand drive one. It's very, very rare because obviously the UK climate wasn't that kind to them. Um, this one spent most of its life in. Uh, actually, belonged to a British couple, uh, but spent most of its life at their holiday home in the south of France, which is why it's. Uh, survived so well uh, and they right. they bought it and obviously had a left hand drive one but they registered it in the UK themselves and um, they brought it back with them about four or five years ago uh, and then sadly the, the gentleman passed away and uh, you know that's that's how I came to acquire it but right yeah it's got an amazing history with it so I've got four or five files of, of paperwork and history all going back to 1989 when they bought it new that's brilliant so yeah it might look a bit rough around the edges but it's it's a survivor and oh, yeah, like it's, say, it's, it's got some heritage about it certainly yeah a patina I think we call it yeah yeah <laughs> no that, that's what festival and exceptional Un unexceptional is all about really isn't it, it? Is. it's it's those survivors that the cars that are still here against the odds and like you say a one owner car with all that history as well it's yeah. just that's something you uh, really can't put a oh, it's high enough value unique. on it's, you know it really is i mean whether, whether i'll keep it or not i don't know i've got 30 other cars so i'm always chopping and changing what i'm driving <laughs> right. but i thought that this this would be the perfect one to bring to this event this year excellent well thank you very much no problem at all thanks mark enjoy the rest of your day i'm here with mike uh, who was on instagram as classic wheels of wales that's right yeah um Mike's car stood out to me because it's the kind of thing that really does uh, epitomise Festival of the Unexceptional. It's a Sierra Sapphire, and it's not a Cosworth or anything like that. It's a 1.8L. No. Windy windows. Yeah. Yeah, basic, <laughs> lovely 1.8. Yeah. Yeah, it's a cracking motor. Cracking motor. 35,000 miles, one owner from new. That's nothing, is it, for no, a car of this age? No, history. I mean, I've driven it from Cardiff today, so it's, yeah. it's on a four-hour trip up. Yeah. Lovely. And it's what, a 1990, is it? 1989. 89, it's one of the really early ones, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. For a sapphire. Yeah, it is, yeah. It's yeah. lovely, yeah. Remember my auntie actually had a red one, um, and hers was a 2.3 diesel, yeah. but it was the same really sort of basic spec of car but yeah. uh, obviously when the Sierra first came out and replaced the Cortina it was quite controversial weren't it people yeah, didn't, didn't like, like the it. jelly mold no they didn't like it no yeah they didn't like it when it came I think what did it came out on an A plate which is why 83 was it when it replaced Something the Cortina like that, yeah yeah people didn't like it yeah but then after a year or two I think they just got you know, it was a bit of a shock because it was like a, like you said, it was like a jelly mould, but it was more aerodynamic. I mean, the Cortinas were boxy and square. They were, yeah. And then it was just a bit of a shock, I think, for people. Yeah. But then after a couple of years, then, I mean, it just. They went on to be a huge success, didn't they? And I think even when the Mondeo um, replaced it, um, they still sort of, for a short time, you could still buy a Sierra. Yeah, yeah. Um, right till, I think 93. Yeah. On a K or maybe that, an L. About that, yeah. 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 I forgot what the model Azura. was. Azure, that's, that's the right. one. They were all in silver. 1.6 or 1.8. What 1. were the blue 8. ones? Or some metallic Yeah, they were awesome. Yeah, yeah. 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 They had the nice wheels. They, they just, I think it was the end of the line, so they just... Yeah, and they had the smoke tail everything. lights and yeah, things, didn't they, on them? They were quite a yeah. smart looking car, yeah, they weren't were. they? Nice, nice, yeah. Yeah. Obviously, under the skin, I mean, we obviously covered the Sierra, they did look quite futuristic at the time. Under the skin, they were still quite a traditional car, weren't they? Still a... It was like a Cortina, really, with another... Yeah. With a different body on it. Yeah, still rear-wheel drive, still at that north Pinto face. engines or yeah. CVH. Yeah. Yeah, it was a, you know, the chain... Like you said, they've changed the body, the, the actual shell. But the runnings of it were Cortina. Yeah. I mean, you had a, They had the 1.6 Pinto, 2-litre Pinto, and the 1.8 
a CVH engine. Yeah. Which uh, which is in here, and I, it's fine. It's, yeah. It's just, it's just enough. Yeah. It's it's just good to have one that's not a Cosworth or a Cosworth look-alike. Yeah. You know, because it's just everywhere you look, this is a Cosworth. Yeah. And it's always the fancier ones that get saved, isn't it? That's why events like what we're here, here at today. Yeah. It's great that they do celebrate these yeah, more traditional. The, yeah, the yeah. bog standard car, yeah. not, not your sports version. Because I yeah. mean, there's probably a sports version in most cars out here, but I just like the bog standard and keep them standard. Don't, yes. don't put fancy wheels on them. I mean, it's got 13 inch wheels on it. Yeah. You know, from new. Little steel wheels and trims. That's it. Yeah. 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 So yeah, it's a great car. So obviously you've had this one for quite a long time. Yeah. Um, but now the car's up for sale, I so understand. For sale, yeah. Um, you know, I buy and sell them, you know, for a living. Uh, I've had this a couple of years now. It's time to move it on to someone. It's one owner from new. Uh, so just let someone else enjoy it. Yeah. Really, yeah. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. Right, well, that's smashing. Well, thank you very much. Cheers, Mark. Cheers. Thanks. Good. Well, I'm quite pleased to see this car here. Um, this is the MPV uh, version of my car. Um, when Renault released uh, the Megane in the UK in 1996, the plan was always to maximise the potential of that platform with as many variants as possible. So initially, you got the um, hatchback and coupe. They were the first cars uh, to launch here in the UK. The first examples of which started to arrive in showrooms around April of 1996 um, but over the next year they released a few other versions so we got the convertible uh, the classic which was the four-door saloon um, and this the scenic MPV uh, this is a mid-spec RT model um, with the 1.6e petrol engine the same 90 horsepower engine as what's in my Megane Coupe um, obviously as I say this time just dropped in an MPV body um, it would have probably been one of the bread and butter engines. I imagine the diesels may have been a bit more popular as well in these MPVs, but they were great little family cars and they actually kicked off this sort of uh, boom in the MPV sector. So, uh, such as today, we've got this uh, real boom in SUVs of all different shapes and sizes. Um, back in the day, it was the same thing was happening but with MPVs um, and I never thought I'd see a day where things could change but uh, obviously they have. MPVs I actually think were far more practical than many of the SUVs that we do have now but obviously um, a lot of people just like the image of an SUV rather than an MPV. Uh, Style, modelled very much on the Renault Espace, um, which were Renault's larger MPV that uh, took the world by storm in the 1980s. But Renault was acknowledging that not everyone needs a car that size and not everyone needs a seven-seater. Um, but some people do like that versatility of having those individual seats in the back that you can sort of slide and uh, till and completely remove if you needed to. And the day just keeps getting better because I bumped into yet another YouTube celebrity. Um, Rob from Beards and Bangers. Hello, Mark. Hey, Rob. Nice to see you again. You too. How are you doing? Yeah, not so bad. Thank you. It's a great Good. event, isn't it? It's... Uh, I've only covered a half of it so far. It's more um, than I have. Yeah. It's... Uh, and I think they're still coming in, by the looks of it. Yes. Yes. It took me... Well, it took me over an hour to get in, I think. Wow. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, the car you've brought is probably towards the newer end of what's now appearing here at Photo, isn't it? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I brought my Rover Streetwise, which is the two-litre turbo diesel. Um, I've had this car about two months. Right. Uh, bought from a subscriber. Okay. And, uh, yeah, I'm doing a light restoration on the bodywork. We've got a couple of dents here and there, which, with a 20-year-old car, you'd expect. Yeah. Uh, but we're also giving the engine a bit of a tune-up. Okay. Hard to believe these are 20 years old, isn't it? It seems like just yesterday they were. Yeah. yeah. Obviously, in period, I mean, the, by this point, the Rover, MG Rover reputation, um, things were starting to dwindle a bit, weren't they, sadly? Yeah, so this, I mean, this is a 2004 um, car, so we're, what, 9, 12 months away from the demise. Yeah, well into Project Rover. Drive by that point. Yeah, and it shows we've got the Mark II, the Streetwises um, all had the, the facelift dash, Yeah. which is notoriously brittle, so if you, we have a look inside, you'll see all the air vents are right. broken, and uh, they, one thing that does work is the air con, but yeah. um, you know, it is pretty basic inside. The Streetwise is an interesting concept, though, because obviously, with the exception, I think Volkswagen had a Polo, didn't they, with a, a similar sort of thing at the time, where it was basically a, a regular run-of-the-mill hatchback, uh, but with a bit of plastic cladding stuck on it, yeah. um, just to give it a little bit, you know, these roof rails, to give it a bit more of a rough, tough, um, off-road, but sort of city car yes. um, look to it. Um, and it didn't really 
pay off at the time. Um, 20 years on, obviously, everyone's driving compact SUVs. Uh, so, I don't know, maybe once again, Rover was ahead of the curve. I, I think they were. <laughs> I mean, you know, we had this cut, this kind of styling with the, you know, the chunky, the chunky black, black plastic front and back, the, the uh, wheel arch liners, the, the trim on the doors. And yeah. then, you know, what, 10 years later, we saw the Renault... C3 Cactus. Oh, the Citroen. Yes, Citroen. the Cactus. Citroen. Yeah. I know what I mean. Yes. I know what I mean. Yeah. Um, almost similar styling. So yeah. C3. And since then, obviously Dacia with uh, Sandero Stepway. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's a. I don't. I think I've said it in a video of my own. You know, Rover were ahead of the curve yeah. by probably ten years. Yeah. I didn't realise they actually had the two litre. Turbo diesel, and it's quite big for a car of this size. Yeah, so you, the m most common um, engine variants, the 1.4 right. petrol K series on these. Yep. Um, there are a few 1.6. Yeah. There's a few 1.8 step speeds. So they did an automatic in 1.8 form only. Okay. And then there was the two litre turbo diesel. So it's the L series engine. Yeah. Uh, if you buy, if you have a Land Rover from the same time, it's like to have this engine. This went in the 25s, right. 45s, and their derivatives. So if it can pull a four-wheel drive Land Rover, it'll certainly have no problem with a two-wheel drive city car it, then. Yeah, it says only putting out 100 brake horsepower. Right. Um, as standard, this one's putting out a little bit more than that now because I've done yeah. some bits to it. It must be bags of torque. It's uh, yeah, I think factory spec is about 240 newton meters, which is huge. Yeah. For, um, for a car that doesn't weigh a great deal. Yeah, the 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 weight, the sort of weight, the the power or the torque gain is slightly offset by the weight of the engine. Right. Okay. So because it's a cast iron block, we're about 150 kilos heavier than a K series. Right. Okay. And that feels in the steering. Yeah. You tend to have a, more of an understeer tendency as well. It, it actually handles very well because the front's very planted because of the additional weight. So it's, yeah. it, it actually. It, given that it's, the suspension's raised up and you've yeah. got additional weight up the front, it does actually it handles pretty nicely. Yeah, because if you scratch back away from this body, really, what's underneath is still a Rover R8, isn't it? It's a yeah, Rover 25 or 200. It's yeah, yeah. Um, R3. Yeah, but I think the R8s before because the. They were saying you can actually swap an R3 and an R8 dashboard. Yeah. Obviously, the R8 was around from 189. Yeah, 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 yeah. The early, yeah, but no, the 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 skeleton of the car is basically the same. Yeah. Um, well, then why change what's already good? <laughs> the R8s were good cars, so yeah, solid. Yeah, cars. Yeah. Uh, starting to really come into their own now. So who knows? Maybe one day the trusty yeah. uh, 25 as well and Streetwise yeah. as well. well I'm, I'm hoping. I mean, the Streetwise, I think, is is is. Probably one of the most unappreciated of the modern MG Rovers. Yeah. Um, so that's why we formed a very small group um, called 2024 Year of the Streetwise. Okay. Uh, so we're hoping, we're already talking to a few of the car clubs, and hopefully mm. there'll be some sort of decent Streetwise representation right. next year. Yeah. Well, that's something to look forward to then. Yeah. Uh, and for anyone who wants to see, I'm sure be, this will be featuring a lot more on your own channel, won't we, we Rob? Will, yes. I've just started a series about the tuning of it. So I've got given the plan already, um, yep. episode one. Episode two is going to be out in the next couple of weeks when we look at what's been done to the engine. Yep. Uh, we're actually waiting on the, uh, the ECU to arrive. So. OK. Yeah, so as soon as that can go in and then change the injectors. So these are, the L series are very tunable engines, so you can take them from 100 to 160, 200 brake horsepower incredibly easily. Oh, right, OK. Um, right, well, that's uh, plenty of exciting stuff to come on yeah. Beards and Bangers then. Thank Excellent. you very much, Mark. Cheers, Rob. Thank you. A car that I remember from my childhood, uh, because my primary school headmaster drove one, um, Volvo 340. Um, but these didn't actually start out life as a Volvo at all, did they? Uh, Matt, you've no. owned this fantastic car. I believe these were a DAF, weren't they, originally? Yeah, they were designed uh, by DAF uh, in the 70s, um, and then Volvo were looking to get into the small car market, didn't have the access to the smaller engines they wanted, so ended up working with DAF who could procure the Renault engines that are in these and yeah, yeah that ended up buying them out and badging them as Volvos so they they never made it to be the DAF 77 but yeah they came became yeah. the Volvo. Now obviously you mentioned uh, obviously Renault as well these use the the 1.4 clay on font didn't they from Renault yeah. uh, the 1397 that's it yeah um, but they also used the the I think it was the F series the 1721 yes uh, which featured yeah. in a few Volvos and Renaults didn't they yeah. over the years yeah th this one's a 1400 
but yeah, they did use the 1.7 after a while, and they weren't as reliable as, as these, and uh, these engines have been going on in Darches until uh, the early 2000s, so uh, a lot yeah. more reliable. Well, I know on certainly on the Renaults, the 1.7s, uh, a bit like with the GT Turbos, they used to suffer from hot starting problems with fuel evaporation. Yes. Uh, oh yeah, this, this <laughs> is a nightmare. Starting from cold, she starts perfectly. If you're in a petrol station, she'll start straight away after that but you leave it five ten minutes and uh, nightmare to start i couldn't get it started on the drive in here and then it just puffs lots of smoke out so yeah, yeah. i must admit that i was tempted in the queue to switch the engine off but there's always that fear that it might not start again <laughs> yeah with this um yeah if i leave it for you know five ten minutes that's it it's a nightmare to start but then you know from cold it's perfect so yeah i think it is fuel evaporation and yeah. it's just part of the car so how long have you had this one yourself then matt I uh, bought it, it was during the lockdowns, so well, three years now, it's my third visit here. Okay. Uh, I was in the concourse two years ago, nice. um, so yeah, second year out, out here, which, which is nice. So yeah, bought it during lockdown. I've uh, been looking for one for a while because um, I wanted it to be the, the free door, the 1.4, the manual gearbox. Yeah. Um, four or five speed? Uh, four. Four, yeah, so noisy trip up here, 60 mile an hour at the most kind of thing because it starts to get a bit noisy. Where have you come from today, Matt? Uh, Brecon in Wales. So, right. Yeah, in the Brecon Beacons. So, yeah. so yeah, I bought it during the lockdown, uh, searched for the perfect one and of course because of the lockdowns wasn't able to travel to go view it so ended up buying it blind and getting it delivered and thankfully it turned out to be as honest as the owner said. So yeah. <laughs> otherwise, uh, yeah, I, I've been bitten before by rusty cars and I'm just glad this wasn't one of them. <laughs> yeah, excellent. Well, thanks very much for having a uh, a quick chat with me today no, about this you. car and uh, yeah enjoy your day and you. <laughs> yeah so uh, obviously Matt's travelled all the way from Wales uh, but this show attracts people from all over the place. I've seen pictures the last few days of people getting on ferries um, out of Ireland. Um, I think last year we had somebody came from the Netherlands. So, yeah, um, I know a, one of the cars I'm hoping to feature a bit later. Um, I think the owner has travelled from the Mull of Kintyre. So, uh, yeah, really does attract a lot of visitors. So, familiar face on the channel um, with the distinction of being the second person on the channel to be interviewed three times. Uh, it's Dickie. Hi, Dickie. Hello, Mark. Um, so last time I spoke to you was with the Tamer, weren't it? The Lancia. Yeah. Um, today you've brought a car I've actually wanted to see for quite some time. Um, Renault 19, but what's special about this one? It's a really early one, isn't it? It's a phase one on a G-plate. So these cars came out in 1989. Um, and interesting thing with this one, being it's festival and exceptional, it's not a 16 valve, which most of the 19s that have been saved seem to be 16 valves. Um, yours is a 1.4 energy, I believe. It is, yeah, it's 1.4 TSE energy, which is the highest spec you could get in a 1.4 yep. in a phase one, yeah. Yeah, and I imagine it will probably top of the range for a time. The 16 valve come a bit later? Yeah, the, si the 16 valve was a, very much a hot hatch in the phase one, although you could get, um, I think you could get an executive spec in the phase two. Mm. But I don't like, I've had both phase two and phase one 19s actually. I had the, I had the phase two beer it's over 20 years ago. Uh, which came to a bit of a sticky end. I wrote that off. He had an argument with the Bedford Rascal. Right. Um, and it, and um, neither of them won. There were no winners in that battle. Well, I've got to say, I can't imagine many cars lose to a Rascal in that kind of battle anyway. The 19 was very <laughs> tough. Mm. I mean, only... Because it was, it was still a low-value car at the time. I think it was the only reason it was... But the kind of damage it sustained, um, it took out, like, right the way down the side. So it, it was... It was an uneconomical yeah. repair, then. Yeah, I hadn't had it very long, and it was immaculate. Yeah. It's like, it, honestly, it was it was so tidy. It was such a clean car. Yeah. Um, I know this particular one, this is the one car you've mentioned, is the, the keeper, isn't it, out of the fleet? Uh, 100%, although I've got the Carlton now. And the Carlton's never going anywhere either. Your, your favourite's the one that you're with at the time? Maybe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, no, this is always the favourite. Yeah. This will always be the favourite, yeah. um, because this car just means... This car's almost like a soulmate. Yeah. I mean, she's in reasonable condition. Now there's a little bit of lack of appeal here, but, but generally, for, for the age of the car... It's not in very good condition. No, I've seen a lot worse. I've seen a lot worse. It's Survivor, I've never got rid of the smell of cigarettes out of it because the first two owners had it for a combined 24 years and I think they both, like, smoked... Well, the chain smoked, basically, and the, the seats are nicotine-stained and I don't try and wash them because they probably just fall apart. The seat covers are in a poor condition anyway. Yeah. I've had loads of opportunity to, to improve this car and just never done it. Yeah. Because I've just driven it, because it's such a usable 
reliable car yeah that i'll never take it well i'll take it off the road for the winter and think oh i shall do so and i just leave it in a corner until it's time for it to come out again but this year when it comes out off the road in november it is going to have to have the the list of advisories have been building up and it does need some welding so yeah we will be getting that over the winter excellent well it's uh, good to see it's a survivor and good to hear it's going to continue to survive it's going to get the work that that it needs Oh yeah, I mean, yeah, it'll get, say, it'll never be, really, it should have a respray as well as other things, but it never will, so I just just love it as it is. Well, it certainly looked good enough to me when I was passing it on the A1 this morning anyway. Yeah, it looks great at 70 (laughs) miles an hour, (laughs) and in the rain. (laughs) That's excellent, well, thanks very much, Dickie, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, pleasure to meet you again, Mark. On board the Renault 19, and uh, look what we found here. Happy Mondays, step on, 7-inch single, remember those. Um, Yeah, apparently this was um, in the charts when this car was registered back in 1990. Um, So yeah, a while since I've sat in one of these, in fact, uh, my dad had one as a courtesy car uh, when his Renault 5 was in for some warranty work back in the mid-1990s. That was a Phase 2 car, of course. Uh, This being a very early Phase 1, but as a TSE, it's actually quite plush for the time. So we've got this lovely velour on the upholstery, a uh, little bit tired in places now, but as I say, very original um, and high spec for the time. We've got um, an electric sliding sunroof, which sadly I'm told doesn't work now, um, but it's got the blind and everything. That would have been uh, considered to be quite um, something special at the time, a very desirable uh, option. We sent a console with the map lights and everything. Oh, yeah, and the good old uh, infrared receiver for the central locking. Um, no end of pain to be had in there, as I'm finding myself at the moment. Uh, but yeah, dash layout's quite nice in these. So we've got this this um, sort of extended dash top here with your radio and your vents and everything in there, all your heater control, so everything's uh, sort of nicely in view. Um, the typical uh, Renault instrument cluster for the time uh, with your speedometer and rev counters to either side uh, and then your sort of fuel and oil and temperature gauges and things in the middle. Um, we've actually got the... Uh, fingertip remote control for the radio as well which again back in uh, the late 80s early 1990s that was just starting to filter down from cars like the Renault 25 and the 21 Um, so cars like the 19 and the Clio you would have started to see these appearing um, but it would have only been on the higher specification models Your, your base model cars still wouldn't have had that crazy to think that's something we really take for granted now uh, this steering wheel actually does look quite old-fashioned by today's standards as well. Obviously, it's pre-airbag, but it's very much um, of the style that Renault had back in the 1980s uh, with this sort of two-spoke design and that offset diamond on there. As well as, uh, obviously, this centre console with the map light and your main light, you've actually got two courtesy lights on either side um, of the C-pillars as well, which I know is something sort of seems quite trivial now, but things like courtesy lights and, um, you know, glove box lids and things like that... Uh, back in that era um you know there was all things that just weren't common in cars you couldn't take for granted same with these internally adjustable mirrors and front speakers again you just didn't get all these things in cars as standard In recent years, Photo has become hugely successful with people travelling from all around Europe to visit the event. There's far too much going on to actually see in the one day that you're there. There's certainly far too much to squeeze into a single video. So I'll be splitting this one down into two or possibly even three parts. Join me in the next video coming very soon, uh, which will include lots more fantastic cars and of course some more of those owner interviews. Hope you've enjoyed what you've been watching so far. Don't forget to leave a like and a comment if you've enjoyed it. Uh, And also hit that subscribe button and the bell notification. Then you will know as soon as part two of the coverage goes live. Thanks for watching.